we are in this transition time, obviously, and, and allow the flexibility, allow the breath to happen and allow creativity to come. Um, I, I mean, imagine if, if the butterfly, uh, before it was a butterfly as a caterpillar, would go into the chrysalis and then as it starts to start, it would start to panic and hold on to its rigid structures and what it knows and it wouldn't be a pleasant experience. And it seems like we are at yet another crux point. Uh, sit in the allowance of that and, and exercise the, the improvisation. Just start to start to incorporate little bits of self-expression. We are self-composting and that's okay. Allow it to happen. Use art to inspire you. Art captures something beautiful in the mathematics of creation, the spirit of creation. And we can use that to remind us we are all it. We're all part of it. We are it. Congratulations. We are full spirit. Hello and welcome to another live inspirational common unity collaboration. This uh, hashtag lick. Uh, this is the last uh, week of this format of the show, uh, the season one. Uh, we've we're reaching a uh, hundred interviews uh, um, for this time. Amazing. Uh, my name is Mark Abadi. It is a pleasure, a pleasure to continually bring you fantastic beings who are doing amazing things in the world. Uh, today is absolutely uh, an example of such fantastic beingness. Uh, please do share this video, like start to share now or have watch parties. There's a little button in the corner here, share and watch, sharing is caring. And if you make any comments, if you want to make any comments, they do come up on my screen and I can relay them to our guest. Today's guest is the wonderful Joshua Fouts, who I met from Bioneers. He's going to be sharing on the art as a vehicle for cultural transformation. Let me tell you a little bit about Joshua. Joshua started his career doing international cultural media, education and technology work before the advent of the commercial World Wide Web. You always know when people start before the web because they call it the World Wide Web. He began his career in Washington, D.C. in the 90s, where he worked for the U.S. State Department and began to experiment with new ways to use radio, television and Internet technology for cultural collaboration. He went on to launch two first of their kind think tanks uh, focused on digital media innovation and cultural relations at the USC Annenberg School in L.A. He ran several nonprofits, including Bioneers, uh, Science House Foundation, and sits on several boards, including the Earth Codes Observatory, uh, which is a nonprofit working to highlight the importance of biomimicry. He's also excited about his collaboration with Collective Transitions, uh, which works to help organizations and people deepen their alignment, deepen and align their ways of working together. Uh, Joshua is passionate about what freedom does to creativity, to, to, to creativity or to creative energy and what perspectives and questions mean to creativity. Um, how taking the time to actively engage with the universe as a co-creative collaborator opens up to possibilities and how all of this can be channeled to create a deeper understanding between culture and people. He weaves passion for media, philanthropy, the arts, education, technology and culture, cultural relations into all he does. You can find out more at um, earthcodeobservatory.org or collectivetransitions.com. Great. So without further ado, let us go over to Joshua Fouts. Joshua. Mark Abadi. So nice to see you. Great to see you as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Why does it only show one audio? I'm just going to change and add an audio. There. Okay. So that should, no, that's transitioned me back to me. Hold on. I'm uh, feeling stereophonic at the moment. You're feeling stereophonic. Okay, you are here um, and that should have worked. Yes, I mean, you're here, but it only seems to have one thingy. Let me just check with the audio. Anyway, tell us, how are you today? How are you finding the, the lockdown and all that fun stuff? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm feeling uh, very full of gratitude and excited and uh, really open to the potential of um, what this time is affording us. Right. So, uh, right. What, what are you finding is, is most uh, poignant for you at this time? You know, what's most poignant for me is really sort of 
turning uh, up the prism of what the cur this current moment of time we're living in is to one of opportunity. You know, a lot of what we're experiencing is very real trauma. Um, I think there isn't a person on the planet today who has not been touched by this global Jo uh, Lu Lu Joshua, losing you a little bit yeah. there. Um, I think we uh, had um, uh, astrologer for uh, a woman by the name of Jessica DeRuza, who has a uh, who has a you know, YouTube channel called Trust Psyche. She talks about how um, if you take a more feminine perspective on what we're, what we're experiencing right now. Um, uh, she compares this to being in the birth canal. If you think about when, when every human is being born, they th the, the world is, is experiencing a, a series of shocks. And those shocks feel like it's the end of the world. You've, we've been nine months cocooned in this, in this safe womb. And then all of a sudden, we're experiencing these massive earthquakes. And mm. it feels like the end of the world. But the result of that is actually rebirth. And I think that's a better metaphor for what we're experiencing right now. We're sort of in the birth canal of a cultural transformation. Have we passed the morning sickness phase? <laughs> I think we're well past the morning sickness. I think we're at month. I think we're in the birth canal now. Now we're just having trouble sleeping. <laughs> no, I think it's that the, the, the mother is birthing us, is birthing this new culture. So, yeah. So, so what, what, what do you feel is going to look like? I mean, you know, I'm still seeing these riots and stuff like that happening in, in Portland, of all places, which we're, I'm about to head to. Um, what, I mean, obviously, this, this is, you know, this time has, has required us to sort of step forwards and, and deal with the unconscious stuff that's been hidden all this time. Um, yeah. I mean, how can we how can we use this to to are we using this in our technology? Are we are we feeding this into changing the technology? I definitely think I think we're do, doing all of the above. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at over the past few months, um, and uh, this is through uh, well, actually yesterday I just got through with a seventy two hour um, uh, uh, seminar with a new, another program that I'm affiliated with called the Edmund Hillary uh, Fellows Program. And uh, what we were convening was a group of uh, many uh, impact entrepreneurs and technologists who are trying to reimagine how technology can be in service of the new economy, a new culture, mm -hmm. um, what have you. Um, and so that was pretty exciting. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a Brazilian uh, technologist and entrepreneur uh, who I'm, I'm a big fan of, who I think is really uh, uh, reimagining how technology can be expressed and can help facilitate this transition. His name's Michel Zappa, and his um, his work is at a site called Envisioning.io. So that's right. Envisioning, and uh, and he what he's doing is re some really interesting sort of uh, visual expressions, taking sort of inventory of all of the cultural elements that uh, almost like you can if you could tweak a culture based on all of the different factors that go into play. And then uh, it's this beautiful, beautifully architected 3D interface where you can actually go in and shift one thing and shift another and then get to see sort of the, the, the reactions. It's almost like a, um, I think it would be inexact compared that this, Michelle will make, <laughs> correct me, but I'm gonna call it sort of a, a sim city for futurism. Right, right, yeah. right, like a 3D puzzle type of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so what are you working on at the moment? What's your what's taking your interest? Because you you've you've left Bioneers, right? You're no longer running Bioneers. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so about how how long were you there? I was there um, uh, about six and a half years. I started in December of 2013, and I ended uh, right after um, Burning Man last year. Mm, mm. All right. And so then, so then, what's what's taken your interest since then? You know, uh, what's alive for me right now, uh, to borrow from another uh, philosopher, a friend of mine, uh, named Je who's also a Jessica, is being in the state of, um, have you heard of this Japanese dance called Buto? Yes. Uh, it was a dance, an art form that was created in response to World War II. But the thing I love about Buto is that, that the meaning of the word means to resist fixity, right. to resist fixity and that's really the the space i'm in at the moment which is um 
opening myself to uh, what is most in service of of, of the universe and um, uh, not uh, and being present and not knowing, uh, which is not something that has typically been a motivating factor in my life. And uh, I'm from that um, uh, exp experimenting with what with what appears. And so I've got have a number of projects going on. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a collaboration with a, uh, and a lot of these have to do with art, and so that's part of the reason when you and I were talking about what should this, um, what would the topic or title of this program be, art as a vehicle for cultural transformation uh, seemed right. Um, and uh, so there's an artist in Argentina I'm working with right now named Lola Basualdo, who is a uh, classical pianist, and we've been working on creating some uh, compositions of both visual art in collaboration with her piano art as a way of expressing um, the moments that we're experiencing in this uh, sort of great transformation. Right, um, right. So to, got so, a whole so, list of idea things, but I'll, I'll just yeah. pause there. Did you, did, have you, have you seen Kenji Williams' work? That's, yes. Yeah. So I interviewed him a, a few weeks ago. He's a fantastic guy, but but I, I love the idea of blending um, experience, experiential art into creating shifts in people's perception. Um, is that sort of thing that you're going to be creating with this with these artists? Uh, you know, I'm, some of them will be. Some of them, uh, so, some of them have, we've, we've yet to yet to define completely. Mm. Uh, I've also been. Um, really taken by the fa fact that I see a trend of people creating artistic tools to help sort of mitigate or help us understand the moment we're living in. Um, there's a, a collaborator and friend of mine by the name of Chris Beasley who has a site called becomingdragon.com and um, she's a somatic therapist but she's designed a deck of cards that are an effort to help us understand um, and self-reflect on the moments we're, we're we're living through, and I think that that again, it's this um, intersection where 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 people are incorporating art into uh, work that might not have uh, conventionally or traditionally be, been perceived as a venue for art to use that to sort of amplify um, and um, and create more nuance and understanding around the experience. So, so what is it about art that that that, that helps transformation? You know that's a pretty big uh, philosopher's question, um, but I can I can answer it at least partially historically, not being a, an art historian, but uh, but having having read plenty of art history books and philosophy books, the um, you can tell in the child of an academic. The child of an academic always knows to qualify that right. about which they are not an expert. Right. Because, right. You know, so that's just my epigenetics flowing through me. Also, have a sister who's a professor. So. Um, uh, but what we what we've seen throughout history is that at any at almost every signature moment of grand cultural transformation, the path that is demonstrated through the path that illustrates our how to understand what we're experiencing, how to how to address it, are the artists. They're the they're on the front lines of helping to translate uh, through art um, th this this experience and 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 the bounty and abundance of creativity that we're seeing. That I'm seeing coming out um, in response to these this world these worldwide protests um, to living through a plague um, to having to be quarantined uh, people who are resisting uh, the norms that health officials have been have been presenting us etc. I think almost all of that can be captured as an expression of creativity and art. Um, and what what it doesn't necessarily matter what side of the story. Uh, is most resonant with you, or what story is most res resonant with you? And I'm not going to get into the realm of of, of truth. Or I'm talking about authentic self-expression because I think that that uh, that's a, the other is a discussion of journalistic integrity. And I'm talking about artistic authenticity mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. which I think is a category, a separate category. So um, I just I really see more and more artists are illuminating a path forward for us, are explaining to us what we're experiencing and that has a calming effect right right I, it, it seems like there is a um a confluence a, a coming together a kind of a, a revealing of 
cultural clashes that were previously um, swept under the carpet, so to speak. Um, do, do you also see that this is like, this is a real time of sort of revealing truth? I definitely think so. Um, and for those who are conversant in uh, astrology, I've gotten very excited lately about the archetypal um, descriptors uh, that astrology is using to kind of help to inform this moment. Um, and a lot of it has to do with these bringing toxins to the surface and, uh, and, and highlighting and shining a light on mm. the shadow side of, of our culture. And, you know, I was talking to my uh, parents about this, uh, my parents who lived through the, the, the most recent grand revolution that we were, uh, the one of the 60s, and asking them if if they felt um, archetypally that we there were any parallels and what it what it's like to see um, protests on the street and and a, a, a new rocket being sent into space mm. uh, roughly 51 years after they saw that in 1969. Right, <laughs> so, right, <laughs> right. So and and for them it's it's palpable and yet they still see. That so that they they realized that in 1969, when my dad was, had to be escorted out of his day job during the uprising in Watts in Los Angeles, where my parents were living at that time, that um, that the work that was being done then that brought them into the streets to protest for um, for a term that didn't exist then, Black Lives Matter, which exists today, mm -hmm. uh, that energetic is still alive in our society. The work still has to be done. And so we, you know, we see these patterns where the ball moves a little bit forward, and then maybe it retreats and regresses, and then it, but and then it continues to move forward. So, so yeah, I see, I see parallels, and it's great to be in the company of elders, my parents, who were, I was in a stroller then, but who were who were present at the, they remind me that I was in a stroller doing the San Francisco Peace March. Right, so. right. You were there. You were there. You, you weren't marching. You were rolling. You were rolling in the marches. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I um, really enjoyed and liked about Bioneers um, was the 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 uh, energy and presence that was given to the indigenous people, um, mm -hmm. and and the respect and and attention that was given and the voice that was given to those. Um, how do you feel? I mean, I, there was a lot of if you like, um, positive discrimination. I think there's a term from England. I don't know if it's the same in America, but, but you know, it's like, it's like uh, you know, affirmative action. It's a positive discrimination. It's like, oh, okay, you're native. We're going to put you up because you've been pushed down. Uh, do you think that there's some element that needs to be done with that, with the, with the black communities and the people of color in, in America? Uh so the short answer is is yes and being two white males having a conversation about this i feel uh a, um, a little like i uh, out of out of my um element i can say that that i think that that um people who are born into uh an experience that you and i are as white males which is one of extreme privilege uh which has been in which generations have of, of white patriarchal males have built uh, a and created a, a falsehood, which is, uh, if you want to talk about fake news, the ultimate fake news of, of, of the millennia was that whiteness exists. Whiteness mm. is the construct. Um, and, um, and so I, I think there's a, there is a, a lot, a whole lot of work that needs to be done, not just around um, uh, all people of color, not just around the indigenous experience, but the the I think there needs to be a, a complete dismantling of the white patriarchal <clears throat> infrastructure. Right. So that's a pretty uh, that's a, a pretty broad brushed statement, yeah. and it's uh, uh, you know I think there's a lot of places you could go to it, go with it, but but I definitely think I think the simple um, I think your question was was a little more nuanced, which is uh, to what extent could say. Uh, uh, what you were, I think, talking talking about was the tokenization of of Native Amer Native Americans that they sort of get uh, propped up and tokenized rather than really being uh, rather than reparations or real concrete actions being taken to address the inequity that's taken place. And it, yes, I think that 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 same level of work needs to be done uh, for all people of color um, because 
the the fake news of whiteness needs to be dismantled. Yeah. You know, something that, that, that is of interest to me and that's come up again and again in these interviews, and as I said, I'm nearly at 100 uh, of these hour interviews. Congratulations. Thanks. I uh, don't know what the hell I'm doing with them, but no, they're out there. Um, and people enjoy them. The interviewees enjoy them. Uh, so so the, one of the things that has come up is this notion of how do we, how do we meet um, oppression um, and do we fight it? Or do we somehow create space for the oppression to evolve itself? And and and, and my mind goes to the, the you know the the protests and the riots and stuff. And it's like you know you're protesting, you're out there, you're all peaceful, and then suddenly the riot police turn up with fucking tear gas. Do you smash them up in order to defeat the system, or is there somehow a magic to to, to like how do we beat a system that's so strong? that it wants the fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do we fight without fighting, you know? Um, so I don't know that I know the, that I have an, a good answer for that question. I can say that there, there are several um, philosophers and philosophical quotes that kind of have informed my approach. Um, one is that uh, there's a great quote I, I the the author of which I, I've n- never been able to find, which is, um, peace is not the absence of conflict. It's your attitude toward conflict. Hmm. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's your attitude toward conflict. And it took me years to really kind of feel into what that what that means. But um, I, 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 um, you know, revolutions take, uh, and, and culture shift is something that takes generations sometimes. To do, I think that uh, you know. I hope that um, when this current uh, revolution, um, say, uh, reaches a point where the revolutionaries and the people in the street can take a much-needed rest, um, that we will see practical change in our society. That we will see a shift in um, in in our conduct with each other um, and our respect uh, for for our fellow humans and non-humans, for all life, mm-hmm. really, on mm-hmm. the planet. Um, but uh, ha- the, the path forward through that, the roadmap is something I cannot, I, don't, I can't see yet. What, what about this, this notion of using art uh, to, to stimulate cultural change? What, what, what do you think is the best way for us to um, enable, enable that? So... Um, well, it's interesting. Enabling art is a good, how can we enable art? A lot of what I've been looking at are the artists who are sort of toiling in a relative, rel, relative. I won't say anonymity, but um, with uh, who, who seem to only be impacting a few thousand or a few hundred people uh, or a few dozen. And mm-hmm. I've really, um, for as much as I'm cynical about the the, the uh, about the state of social media today and as as sort of an extractive um, uh, um, business I, I see I see social media I, uh, you know as opposed to the oil industry which is extracting um, fossil fuels from the from the ground the social media industry is extracting our attention and and exploiting that for commercial purposes and and kind of dumbing us all down but I but um, what I've been paying special attention to the artists in that world and artists who are doing things that uh, that seem to me to be uh, not receiving a lot of attention but that are that are having an impact on me personally mm. and so uh, I've really been trying to reflect on how much creativity is going out into the into the into the interwebs, and uh, to what extent it's it's touching me, or my soul, or uh, shifting my perspective on, on consciousness, and uh, and I'm and I'm experiencing a lot of it. I'm experiencing a sense of community. I'm experiencing uh, moments where my per, my filter is shifted mm. half a degree or or. 45 degrees and so in as much as 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 that is a, a answered your question about how art can do i think or, or how we can in, empower and enable art i think part of it is it, part of the, the empowering is interacting and engaging with it one of the things i also tried to do during the beginning of the pandemic uh when i was first quarantined it, i immediately went to once i that on day one of quarantine the first thought that came to my mind is 
artists are going to are going to map are going to show us the way forward. And I just started um, buying art from many of my favorite artists. Uh, there's uh, I have a whole list of them that I've been that I've been following and, and supporting. But um, uh, and in response, their art when it enters my home and my interaction with those artists and seeing their day to day shares on social media has served as sort of a tonic for me has been kind of a salve mm, mm. has opened my eyes to new angles and perspectives so um i guess my that my lot the just to distill that into a word right engage i think engaging art is right is how we so so then what are you going what are you doing what have you plans to help like what you know you've you've been involved with some real game-changing uh systems and for a long time, you know, you mentioned the 90s. I mean, you know, <laughs> you mentioned the World Wide Web. I mean, it's the sort of thing my dad says. Uh, but, you know, so you mentioned the World Wide Web. What, right. what plans have you got to na- your next steps? I mean, clearly you're seeing the impact and the power of art and you want to share that with the world, right? The, the power and impact of art. So what are you going to do to share that? Like, what are your, some of your ideas? Have you got any real ideas? I, I get that you're being flexible, <laughs> but like, where 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 is Joshua Phelps going to put his magic next? That's what I want to know. Well, thank you for that. So, um, uh, some things are starting to gel. Definitely, um, I uh, the, one of the umbrellas in which um, I'm uh, probably going to be expressing this is through um, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship that I that I mentioned at the top, which is this um, New Zealand based. Um, fellowship that I was just awarded, and it is an effort to get people uh, who are awarded this fellowship to work in partnership with, uh, with the country of New Zealand. And um, I am very excited about what I see in New Zealand. I don't. I want to. Cap- I want to qualify to saying I don't see New Zealand as a utopia. I know that a lot of us look to their prime minister and their and the way that they've handled. Uh, COVID-19 and the, and their policies on climate change mm. uh, and their relationship with their indigenous uh, for, uh, uh, elders and the first peoples. I mean, just for an aside on that, uh, for those who um, haven't been to New Zealand and haven't seen how they conduct their relationship with, with the Maori, the first peoples of Eotora, New Zealand, uh, every, almost everyone in the country of New Zealand has to learn Maori. Imagine, imagine, if you will, a British uh, MP or a U.S. Congressperson standing up to give a speech before any any moment of, of, of Congress or Parliament, and and delivering the first remarks or a prayer in an indigenous tongue. Mm. That's what New Zealand is like. Wow. Right, there, right, there, right there, to see a descendant of a white European, usually a male. Uh, uh, but of course, New Zealand has a female uh, prime minister, but they have plenty of white white males in leadership. Yeah. Stand up, and before speaking to their parliament, give a speech in Maori. I think is a, is something to witness. Amazing. So, um, close parens. What uh, to get to your question? Uh, what's coming up for me is uh, possibly uh, I'm looking at maybe doing a collaborative, um, uh, two collaborative podcasts. Uh, I've got uh, those are those are currently in in sort of rough development with some uh with some collaborator, collaborators of mine who are sort of philosopher artists entrepreneurs um it uh there's a slight possibility of some iteration of a book um but but that's i think way too far down the road but there's a, a there is data being accumulated yeah. and there's been there uh has been some talk about uh some sort of center of gravity. A lot of what I've done throughout my career, for better or for worse, is um, I've, I've launched a lot of uh, think tanks and nonprofits. And um, Bioneers was an exception to that. I actually came into a, a, an existing organization that was 25 years old. Right. But previous to that, I'd been launching organizations. And um, there's a conversation starting to come around that might be there there's space enough or a vessel enough for an organization but that is even farther down uh but in this accelerated time you know we live in in 2020 we we go through a week and we feel like we've lived a year so i don't want to assign or ascribe anything to that um i also think that the way that we tell stories is is evolving look at you you're 100 episodes into uh, a body of work that is still boring 
you know, and I look at the back of their archives, and each one of them is this thing, but they also weave a tapestry together. Like, you know, there's a, there's a meta story that comes through, and um, and so uh, I don't I don't want to look at, at the term book in a in in a linear way, but in in a way that may be sort of a a, a, a vessel for capturing, and expressing, and, and amplifying the story I'm seeing. So how's that right. for a convoluted answer? Yeah, yeah, it's very convoluted. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it works somewhere, but I, I like the idea of of of, of the New Zealand uh, approach to things, which is just like being mm -hmm. present with everything that's going on. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned freedom in in your in your um, in your intro bit, and uh, I, you know how freedom affects creati creativity. One of my uh, one of my favorite artists, John Craigie. He's got a very funny song about uh, the the Trump presidency and when Trump got elected, and he, you know he had to perform three days later, and so he had to create a song about about the situation, and, and he decided to create a song explaining how when times are shit, art comes out. Like artists are inspired, musicians are inspired, uh, and that nobody creates great songs when everything's hunky dory, but it's when it's really hard times that the artists are like Ugh, and inspired out. But in your point, you put the, like freedom and how that affects creativity. So how, how are you finding the notion between oppression and, and resulting in art versus freedom resulting in art? So uh, I'm going to cite a pop culture moment. That I don't know if you've seen uh, this new Netflix um, documentary that just came out called Mucho Mucho Amor. And it's the story of uh, Walter Mercado, who is who was uh, the preeminent uh, astrologer in Puerto Rico and the planet during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. Um, but my takeaway, he and he was this uh, this incredibly flamboyant character who yeah. dressed in capes. He had, was very much in sort of the Liberace genre of self-expression. But he was. Uh, if you were if you were to be categorized today in twenty in in the nomenclature of twenty twenty, we would probably call him a non-binary. Uh, we would we would sort of right. uh, go into a lot of minutia of trying to categorize his freedom of expression. But what my takeaway from watching this person live his live there, even though he self-identified as a man, live there. Uh, their life was was one of embracing the freedom of expressing yourself authentically. Right. And um, you know, there's a, I, I've been that's a, that's been a challenge for me personally throughout my life. Uh, I've often felt at odds with how do you coexist in two systems or multiple systems, a system which wants you to behave one way, and a, which says that this is the path towards success. This is how we survive and thrive in mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. Versus complete authenticity, which which our society um, uh, shuns, and uh, one of the practices that I've added to my day, to my weeks, is because of this is um, is improv. I started. There's a Brazilian friend of mine, uh, Rodrigo uh, Vergara, who I've been. He's been hosting there in Portuguese. I, I I've spent many years in Brazil, so that but but it's improv nonetheless. And he has a half an hour class. He offers it every day. And you go in and you do these improv exercises. But the beauty of them for me is that he's forcing me to step outside of mm. all of the societally imposed rules and regulations that I adhere to and uh, express myself in a completely out outlandish way. And if I take a little bit of that energetic with me throughout the day, that piece of freedom, that's sort of my definition of freedom, I feel like I move a little bit more toward authenticity right. and I move a little bit more toward achieving uh, uh, these, I don't even want to call them goals, but let's say um, being in service of purpose, uh, which is which is sort of my broader goal. Yeah. Y you know, I mean, I think this is where I, a lot of people, and particularly maybe the audiences that are looking at this a little bit more, uh, they find it difficult to, to um, dance the world between self-expression and authenticity and dance into the corporate world, which for all intents and purposes is the majority unauthentic or inauthentic and, um, and and quite destructive against people and in particular people of 
of of color and indigenous people and if you're not basically a white male i mean you know i'm jewish so i kind of i have that little thing in the back of my head like oh we've done loads we've had loads of anti-semitism and racism and shit so i kind of like i've got it in the back but on the appearance i look like just some same old white guy um so so dancing between the corporate world do you feel having been quite in the corporate world and and i i assume you're still quite connected do you feel that the corporate world is becoming more um interested in that sort of world or does it threaten the establishment that they've already set up so that's a that's a really great question and um I, I, you know, I started my career in the federal government, in the U.S. government, the State yeah. Department. So I, I was wearing a suit and tie. I was part of that, that, um, that culture, uh, and I, I, I've experienced it. But uh, to answer your question, you know, one of the markers for me on the fact that things are shifting in the corporate world was something we were talking about before we started recording, which was, um, which was Burning Man. And I'm sensitive to the fact that I think Burning Man, because of the uh, of its success, and success meaning its visibility and, and, and it's becoming sort of a global movement, there is a, there is somewhat of a, a cynical pushback on it. But the fact that corporate executives uh, from the highest ranks of our society are conducting meetings on the playa at Burning Man in costume, to me, is a step forward. I think that right. that is uh, because the whole ethos, and you and I know this having spent time at Burning Man, the ethos of being able to be your authentic self and to shed whatever the identity is that you are compliant with mm. in the uh, you know in, in the everyday world, the non-burner world, the default world, as as burners describe it, it to step out step out into that authentic version of self, even for a second, I think also speaks to the to the value of improv, and right. I think it also illustrates how there might be shifts going on in the corporate world. Um, you know, the, the, there was a New York Times article that was talking about how wealthy Wall Street financiers were spending $25,000 to have their custom Burning Man costume designed for them. And it was sort of poo-pooed and it was also criticized by the Burner community as understandably uh, because it didn't seem in alignment with the impetus for creating Burning Man, the sort of self creation part on the other hand i looked at it as you know if people from wall street who are really boxed into a, a, a very conventional culture are stepping outside of that even for a couple days and feeling the liberation of what mm -hmm. it feels like to not be part of that then i think it's a good thing um yes but i may be a monopolier on that no no i i, I agree any 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 experience of self-expression especially one as trans formational as being surrounded by other uh, beings who feel free to express it, it is beneficial so wh why do you think it is that we've developed this society that's based around sort of fear and expectation uh, and and you know how does religion uh, uh, impact this and 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 do you see the sort of the the fall of the religious Systems and the the, the reemergence of sort of cultural wisdom. Right. So my uh, the, the epigenetic academic in me wants to non-academic and yes. child of academics wants to qualify not being a cultural historian and not being a religious theorist. Um, uh, but I've been thinking about this a lot and and spending a, a lot of time actually. Um, uh, uh, doing some sort of a lot of anecdotal research. I, I was trained as an anthropologist, so certainly I'm, nice. this, is a, this is a topic here that lights up my life. But um, I, you know, we, we as, as primates uh, create these systems into which we, uh, to help us understand where, where we fit within the, the primate hierarchy. And, um, and religion is, is um, on the one hand, is a good vessel for that uh, in that it it creates or it's a it's a it's a societal system that that in some ways teaches people how to be human uh gives them rules um on the other hand uh, for many others it helps them connect with uh with the universe um so i I'll, let me just share a little bit of an anecdote one one of the projects i did before 
uh, about, about 10 or 12 years ago was I, I did an ethnography, a documentary cultural study within uh, uh, virtual worlds, 3D immersive video game style spaces. And I was specifically, this is in the wake of sort of the post September 11th era where there was so much division between Muslims and non-Muslims mm -hmm. and a lot of lack of understanding between uh, those communities. And what I, what the study that I, I did with my collaborator was looking at was how are people using 3D immersive spaces, video games, multiplayer video games, non-game spaces like the virtual world of Second Life to create uh, uh, better relationships where there's no possibility for physical violence. Right. What I discovered and what we discovered through the course of this was something actually much more nuanced. Um, I began to uh, interview, um, I did an article that actually uh, um, was published a, about 10 years ago, I guess now, but I was interviewing um, Muslims who were going into the virtual world of Second Life, and I was specifically interviewing um, women. And one of the things, I interviewed a woman uh, who was uh, located in Indonesia, and she said that she was actually going into virtual spaces because it was it, it created a deeper connection with God, with Allah. And mm -hmm. I said, so can you explain how, how, how that's the case? And she said, sure. She said in, in her mosque in Indonesia, it's a uh, very crowded mosque, and out of uh, respect for the men, uh, because it's so crowded, she goes into to worship in an ante room, which is not decorated in this uh, in this incredible, as this work of art, and you think mm -hmm. about what religion, one of the things that religion do, does, uh, if on the one hand it provides us with a system for understanding how to interact with each other, and it helps build community, uh, it's also a place of art. Mm -hmm. I mean, the great cathedrals, the great temples, the great mm -hmm. mosques, the great synagogues of the, pl of the planet are, uh, you step into them, and you have this moment of awe, A-W-E, where you how you feel this connection with spirit mm. and i don't think i think any no matter what your religion's background is you walk into any of these places of of worship and part of that worship is opening oneself because of the art so anyway getting back to that story mm -hmm. uh this woman wasn't able to get experience get exposed to the art that she wanted to that, that so opened her heart yeah. and spirit in the mosque and so she was going into a virtual space to do it because the art was being replicated that there. And that art, that that emulation and simulation mm. of a of a, of a um, place of worship helped for her unlock uh, her connection with spirit and universe. And so nice, nice. Yeah. I like that. Um, that was just something that came up for me. <clears throat> this notion of freedom. And 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 um, you know the the flexibility that you said that you you're embodying now, like you know a tree in the in the wind type of thing. Um, how does structure help us to have freedom? Like, do you do you still value and use structural patterns to help create containers within which freedom can more function, or do you just say to hell with edges? To, to hell with containers, I'm just gonna improv life. Right. So uh, I will uh, answer that question by quoting um, the uh, one of the people who was an incredibly significant influencer on my life, my anthropology professor who recently died. His name was Marco Bicchieri, and he uh, mm -hmm. he grew up in, uh, in it Italy-occupied uh, Tanzania, and so he had this very interesting accent when he spoke English, which was both Italian and East African. Right, right. But Marco would talk about uh, how humans are, we're on, we're on a spectrum. We live on a spectrum as individuals and as society. And the spectrum is basic, as on the one end, uh, variability on the, on the end, other end of the spectrum is predictability. And if you imagine a slider on that spectrum, right. uh, with we each have our own comfort zone for predictability and variability, our own tolerance for what functions for us as a human in terms of predictability versus mm. variability. And, uh, and now I'll share just sort of a, a, another uh, mentor anecdote. So my parents, uh, who, were psych who were experimental psychologists, uh, when they were raising me, 
and we weren't at the San Francisco peace marches or my dad wasn't being escorted during the Watts uprising. Uh, they were, um, they wanted to make sure as young psychologists that I wouldn't become uh, anal retentive. And mm -hmm. Freud's theory of anal retentiveness is that uh, when we first soil our diapers, our parents scold us and then we spend the rest of our lives, this is my thumbnail. Uh, yes. Uh, trying to compensate it for it and anal retentiveness, we end up being hyper clean. So my parents, in order to prevent me from doing this, would sing a song celebrating this creation. And they had a little poop song that they sang, and they would take me in my cloth diapers and dump them in the toilet. And my dad likes to joke, and as he joked when he was teaching uh, in his psych classes, that I didn't become anal retentive, I became anal expulsive. So if I translate that through that filter, that I guess means my tolerance is much higher on the, ver the, the variability scale of the slider than the predictability. Right. Uh, and so uh, I think it really depends on the individual. And, uh, and, and the more I've been looking into um, astrology lately, which is having a whole other boom, I'm seeing that as another beautiful prism for um, expressing how we each have a, a different higher level of tolerance for predictability and variability. Some of us need a lot right. more structure to feel to be a happy human. Right. So everyone's everyone's you know everyone's individual. We're all individuals, says Monty Python, uh, uh, collaborator. Um, <clears throat> but in that, should we be yeah. looking towards what makes us comfortable, or what makes us uncomfortable as a way to grow? Oh, I'm a big person, big fan of, of discomfort, discomfort, and right? Edges and uh, and trans personal transformation. I feel like. Uh, you know, I'm put. We're put on this planet to experience, and part of experience is not, is stepping outside of your comfort zone and right. reimagining yourself and reinventing yourself. The uh, friend of mine who I mentioned earlier, um, I, I know that the other, the second Jessica, uh, talks a lot about um, has been talking a lot about just starting as an artist and uh, and a philosopher, starting from zero, and and. Uh, she had a whole um, kind of alter ego that, that she was using as an expression of self uh, in social media and just deleted it the other day and started anew. And I thought how beautiful it was to sort of compose that old artistic right. version of yourself and move into, and, and, and she's been sharing those thoughts on her, on her Instagram feed uh, about this process of self reinvention. And uh, I draw a lot of strength and inspiration from that. I think that that stepping outside of your comfort zone uh, is the order of the day. And so many of us are honoring that and that's bringing people into the streets, yeah. you know, and, and more. So, so how, how can people watching, you know, um, like, okay, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I, I see self-composting sounds like a great idea. Where, where the hell do I start? Do I just look for what I don't like in life and then sort of walk that way? I mean, how, how do people begin and, and how can they use improvisation and art to assist the journey of the composting? So I guess uh, start, uh, not to be, not to be snarky, but I think, uh, that, so I've, so a couple, so um, the organizations that I've been really excited about that you mentioned at the top. So uh, there's an organization called Collective Transitions that I've affiliated mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. uh, that is helping organizations understand how to process change. And I think that's uh, their collective transitions.com. And I think what they're doing is really helping people, depending on what their comfort level is with change, step into that change and they can do it in a, in a, in a gentle way and they can do it at, what, at, at a level that might be at a higher frequency level. I think that's one. Um, my friend uh, Chris Beasley's uh, card deck of transformations, becomingdragon.com mm -hmm. website, is another way that that uh, that that you can that that she's that people are working to sort of introduce change and transformation into yourself into self. I think on a higher corporate level, envisioning is another way. I think, um, uh, but it's the small steps really. For me, it was stepping into the unknown and taking that first improv class mm -hmm. uh, and realizing the awakening that I experienced. But I had to step out of inertia, which is a big challenge for me to overcome. <laughs> I'd really rather just lie in bed, you know, <laughs> listen to my favorite music, but it's that it's overcoming inertia and stepping into the unknown, like the fool card from the tarot. Right. right? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
So, yeah. so what, what does, uh, I'm still trying to get exactly what's going on in the Joshua Fouts world. Okay. What's the future? What, 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 what do you need? Uh, how can people, you know, oh, oh, what, what's, what's the plan for the next 10 years? What, what do you see is going on in the Joshua world? And wh like, how are you applying your magic? Mm. So, uh, I'm not trying to be evasive at yeah. all, I think, but I think the place that I'm in right now and, you know, that my Burning Man camp is actually called Liminal Labs, right. and I'm very much in a liminal place right now, and I'm trying to embrace that uh, because I feel that we are at a cultural pivot point. Um, and so I, I think that things are going, I'm starting to uh, um, post things more publicly. I just shared on Facebook uh, this collaboration I did with uh with the uh, with Lola Pasualdo, who's in uh, the, the Argentinian pianist, uh, I'm working on um, uh, a new site that will be sort of an expression that, that may be a vessel to hold that. Uh, the Edmund Hillary site, Edmund mm -hmm. Hillary Fellow site, is a place for that. Um, uh, I, I think it's going to be. Uh, I think there, there there are a lot of things that are cooking, um, but the the ten year trajectory is that, um, and being one who is committed to personal transformation. And um, is that I think at the, the best I can answer you right now is being present in the not knowing is is uh, is where you've reached me in this current phase. Maybe we should talk in a couple. Yeah. We, maybe we should talk in three months. And, yeah, and, absolutely. And see a lot more. I think things are going to quicken over the over the next couple of months. And I also think there's a certain beauty to talking to you at a point where things are somewhat liminal. Um, because I think a lot of us are feeling this kind right. of liminal, liminal state. And I know that, that I, th and I think I'm gonna sign a story to you, which is that, you know, in asking you what, what the concrete project is, it, it helps us sort of provide an aspirational goal. And I, and, and I can tell you, I think that, um, I think the thing that I'm most excited about right, right now are these uh, sort of podcasts that I'm, that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, I really love collaborative storytelling. Mm. And so those I think are, nice. are what's, nice. what's ripe. And, um, uh, I also like to kind of start small with things and kind of see what, see how the seeds germinate. So, yeah. So in, in the collaborative storytelling, it, do you think that the storytelling, you know, cause that's the old school way of, of sharing information, passing it down culturally. Yeah. Do you think that storytelling is the way to, um, inspire, um, change is the way is is like a is is storytelling one of the most powerful ways i mean should we all be telling stories yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah. tell stories yeah <laughs> yes yes to, yes to all three absolutely i think that we are i mean if, if you going back to the earliest expressions of 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 uh the earliest relics of of the humans uh, or the homo sapiens or the, or the primates that came before us and paint on cave walls. I mean, we have been telling stories uh, for as long as we've been sharing this planet with all of the other uh, species. Uh, it is, I think, it, it is in our veins. It's in our DNA. It's in our spirit. Um, I, um, you know, one of my, uh, I'm currently visiting my parents in Oregon and I feel and I haven't spent, I, I, I haven't, I've been here for now, I think about eight weeks. And I haven't spent this much contiguous time with my parents, probably in 30 years. Right. Uh, and being present with my parents at, at this phase in their life as, lives as elders, I feel that my, their story is alive in me and our stories are together in a way mm -hmm. that I didn't have the self-awareness when I was... 17 21 mm. 25 30 right yeah so uh and i feel that the stories of my ancestors are alive in me their parents and i have these conversations with them at dinner every night and it brings the epigenetics of these people who live within me to life yeah. and um and so i asked in the guest room that i'm staying in right now if i could put hang pictures of my of the family elders around so that um, i can feel their story alive in me because i think part of what my journey is and again, this is more of this liminal state is working on ancestral healing. I think that's another thing that we talked about in this and, and the way that I'm trying to do it in a personal way. And I'm learning that other people are doing it as well is to reconnect with our, with our families of origin. Right. However we define that. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, 
Joshua, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your uh, our flow. Uh, and, I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to sum up the show, but it's been great to have you on. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm just hang there and I'll, I'll sum up the show and, and I'll come back to you. Okay. Thanks for sharing all your wisdom. And, oh, um, body, thank you. And, and people can find and connect with you. How do they connect with your New Zealand project, by the way? Um, I, I don't have a URL for that yet. Uh -huh. um, so, but the Edmund, I think that you can find me on the Edmund Hillary Fellowship page. Right. So okay. More okay. information there. Right. Edmund Hillary Fellowship. EHF.org. Yeah. And I'm in cohort six. Cohort six. Lovely. Okay, great. I'll just sum up what I've got from you, and uh, and I'll come back to you. Hang there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. So. <laughs> You know, it's always it's always fun when you when you talk with a structuralist who I would class Joshua as, uh, uh, who is now flexing and, and flowing in this in this tree like uh, allowance. And it seems like we are in this transition time, obviously. And it's 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 a time not to panic. You know, don't panic, don't panic and allow the flexibility, allow the breath to happen and allow creativity to come. Um, I mean, imagine if, if the butterfly, uh, before it was a butterfly as a caterpillar, would go into the chrysalis and then as it starts to start, it would start to panic and hold on to its rigid structures and what it knows, it wouldn't dissolve and it wouldn't be a pleasant experience. It's dissolving and it's turning into a butterfly and it needs to die completely. It needs to dissolve completely in order to unfold into the new. And it seems like we are at yet another crux point. Yes, okay, there was one in the 60s, and, and, and there's, there's times there's crux points in life. This is definitely one of them. So if you're feeling, like all of us, uncertain about the future, uh, sit in the allowance of that. Sit in the flexibility of that and, and exercise the, the improvisation. Be be creative. Uh, uh, allow yourself to freely express yourself. Who are you? Be Burning Man in your everyday. Like just, just start to start to incorporate little bits of self-expression so that you can um, um, bring genuineness to your life. And and don't worry so much about what the twenty-year plan is or the ten-year plan. Be in the flexibility when we birth out of this. Uh, transition period out uh, of this through the birth canal when we actually birth out then we can start to okay now I can start to settle in and and you've already practiced the creativity so it's going to be uncomfortable and it is uncomfortable for most of us and we are we are self-composting and that's okay just like the caterpillar self-composts it's okay allow it to happen and, and maybe exercise and use art to inspire you. Art captures something beautiful and, and the artistic and the buildings, architecture and, 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 and physical art, even music is art, of course. It, it captures something in the mathematics of creation, the spirit of creation. And we can use that to remind us that even though this stuff around here looks like stuff, there is something over and above it the spirit of creation, which we are all it. We're all part of it. We are it. Congratulations. We are full spirit. Now, just remember it. How do you remember it? Use art. Use art to inspire the freedom of self-expression. And that doesn't mean go wild and, and just destroy everything you know, but but be open to being flexible so that your your caterpillar can become the butterfly. All right, cool. And, um, and and remember, it's, you know, it's cultures. In, in different cultures, there are different stories which can help the reflection. It's all about mirrors and being reflected to so that we can see what we are. Everyone's individual. We're all individuals. And so use mirrors to reflect to where your individuality is. Perfect. All right, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, thank you to my guest, Joshua Fouts. Um, we don't really know who's coming on tomorrow. Uh, it was going to be Krikor, Krenitsha, a DJ, musician. We'll see what happens. Um, but tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, please share these videos. It's all wonderful. Uh, 
allow flexibility to occur, you got this. And even when you don't, you got it. Thank you so much, Mark Abadi, signing out. Thank you.